Hi, I'm Jimmy Mattia. Right now, I'm just practicing a little pool with a good friend of mine, the great Danny Medina. We're getting ready to head to Aspen, Colorado, where we're going to meet with 15 more of the greatest men and women players in the game today. And while we're there, we're going to put together a series of instructional pieces, which is really going to improve your game. Let's face it, in this sport, the more inside secrets you know, the more fun you're going to have. And speaking of fun, hey, amigo, you haven't missed a ball in an hour. Are you ever going to let me shoot again? Mataya, I don't plan on letting you shoot the rest of the week. Now, he's a real fun guy to play with. Now, what I want to talk about is the proper selection of a cue. For those of you who have never had a professional cue and really don't know how to go about choosing one, what I would suggest is to go into your local billiard parlor, take some cues out of the rack, all different weights. Now, how do you know what weight it is? Well, usually there'll be a little insignia on the cue right here. This particular cue says 17. That means 17 ounces. What I would do is get a bunch of cues that weigh different ounces, pick them all up and decide which one feels too heavy for you, which one is too light for you. When you find the one that feels just right, and this is the one I use, this is a 19 ounce cue stick. A lot of the professional players, that's a standard cue for them is 19 ounces. Once you find one that feels the right weight, then you want to see how tall the stick is. Most people play with a cue that's between 57 and 58 inches tall, depending on how tall they are. But 57 to 58 inches is a standard length. 19 ounces is a standard weight. The next thing you want to have on your cue stick at all times is your tip is very important. A half moon shaped tip. If you got a tip that's flat, you're going to miss cue a lot. You can't get English on the cue ball. So remember, the length, 57, 58 inches. Standard weight, about 19 ounces. And make sure your tip is always in a half moon shape get a lot more action on the cue ball that way. Now the next thing I want to talk about is proper table selection. There's a lot of people out there interested in becoming professional players and traveling on a professional circuit. You're going to find one thing when you get to all these tournaments, all the tables are going to have new cloths, which means the tables are going to roll much faster. If I was looking to go to a tournament, I would first come into the pool room and look for a table that has the newest cloth on it because it's the one that's going to roll the fastest. Now, as you can see on this table here, it has a little bit of wear and tear on it. Obviously, this cloth has been on this table for a little while. But this cloth over here seems to be quite green, which means this is a brand new cloth. Now, this is a table I would want to play on because I think this table is going to roll a lot faster than this particular table. And that's what you're going to find at tournaments, new cloths with a lot of speed. You should also take a look at the pockets. If you got a table that uh, when you hit a ball and it hits the rail here and it still goes in the pocket, well, hey, these pockets are too big. You don't want to practice on a table like this. Just normal tightness of the pocket is what you want. Try to find a table that has normal tightness of the pockets and a lot of green on it because that's what you're going to find in tournament action. Okay, I'm going to show you some of the basic fundamental bridges that are used when you play a game of pool. The first bridge for beginners is the easiest one to make. You just make a fist with these four fingers and bring this thumb over against the index finger and just kind of let it curl a little bit so that you make a channel to slide that cue through just like this. Okay, now after you try this and uh, this becomes real easy to do, now all you do is just sp spread out all four fingers and you keep the heel of the hand here on the table and the pressure points of these four fingers and you've still got that channel between the knuckle and the thumb to slide the cue. And a lot of the professionals use this on some of the shots in the game. Okay, now the next one is the one that gives everybody so much trouble. It's called the tripod bridge. And what you do is just lay your hand flat like this and lay the stick right between your thumb and index finger. You bring this 
index finger over and put it against your thumb and now you bring that middle finger under and against your index finger so you form a tripod for all three fingers and your pressure points are the heel of the hand you don't want it up in the air like this you want it that palm of the hand flat on the table the heel and you want those the pressure points on the fingers and you make a nice channel to slide that where you have real firm control of the cue okay now once in a while you end up in this position where you have to shoot over a ball okay and I've seen a lot of different bridges now you have to get these hand, get these fingers kind of straight up in the air and what I do because my fingers are a little shorter is I put this index finger right against the middle finger and try to keep that middle finger straight up and down and put these other fingers on the table and then I try to make a V for that Q to slide through so that I can get up and hit that white ball without hitting that one ball that I'm shooting over. The main thing is get elevated up in the air and get the fingers kind of straight up in the air as you can and try to keep it as solid as you possibly can. Okay, now the rail bridge. When the cue balls froze to the rail, I see a lot of people when they're beginning play, they elevate the cue up in the air like this. And anytime your cue, you start elevating that cue, your accuracy is going to go way down. So you, when the cue balls froze against the rail like this, you lay your hand flat on the table, these four fingers, and you bring this thumb up and you make a channel right between the thumb and the index finger for that cue to slide through. And you're guiding it a lot with this index finger and some people even crimp it a little bit up in the air to kind of slide it, have something to guide the shaft of that cue. And you try to keep your cue as close to level as you can. You have to elevate maybe a little bit, but try to keep it to a minimum. Okay, now the next rail bridge is when you're off where you can't bridge on the table, the last bridge. What I'm going to show you today is when you're off the rail just a little bit, now you use a little different bridge. You put all five fingers together just like this right here and put that cue right against your thumb to guide that shaft of the cue. You bring this index finger over, the middle finger against the cue so you got some friction to help guide that cue and you can still keep the cue nice and level and you've got a good solid support with this type of a rail bridge when the cue ball is off just enough where you can't bridge on the table. Okay, those are the different bridges. Uh, most of the bridges that come up when you're playing a game, that'll cover 95% of the shots that you come up with when you're playing a game of pool. You know, there's a lot of times when you're shooting pool, you come across shots that you just can't reach. I don't care if you're seven feet tall. That's when it's time to use the bridge. So for more information on how to use the bridge properly, let's listen to Lori John Jones. For everybody who can't reach a shot, right here, I can't reach this five ball. So what I'm going to do, this is my bridge, in fact, this is the crystal clear bridge. What you do is when you set up for a bridge shot, you want a lot of distance between the bridge and the cue ball. You want to take the bridge with your left hand or your right hand, whatever hand you shoot with, and hold it away from away from you so it doesn't get in the way of your body. Then you want to put this elbow out like this. This is very important that the elbow's like this, never like this. You want the elbow straight out and you want to stroke through the ball just as though it's a regular shot. And that's the way you would use the bridge. You know, in a professional tournament match, there's only one way to decide who shoots first. So for more on that, let's talk to Belinda Bearden from Austin, Texas. The lag is a skillful way of determining which player has the option of the first break. To execute a lag, you send your cue ball to the foot rail, trying to be the player closest to the head rail. I'll demonstrate. As you know, the break is all important in pocket billiards. 
If you can be the player to win the lag, and that would probably win, you'll be in control of the match. It's always a good idea to practice your lag, not only where you, at the place where you practice, but on the table you're about to play on, because as you know, tables play differently and they're different speeds, so that uh, you'll be accustomed to it. Practice the lag on the table you're about to play your match on. You know, there's a number of different break shots in the game of pool. All depends what game you're playing. Well, right now we're gonna play a little nine ball. So who better to show us the nine ball break than the legendary Mr. Boom Boom himself, Wade Crane. The break in the game of nine ball is the first and most important shot of the game. So the better you break the balls, the more successful you'll, you will be in, in high level competition. The break has always been one of my better shots. And I'm gonna show you a few little things that I do that has worked for me for years. Place the cue ball halfway between the center spot and the second diamond. The reason for this preference is it eliminates the scratch in the side. The closer you are to the center of the table, the cue ball has a tendency to jump into one of the side pockets if not hidden exactly full. So from this angle, you will eliminate a lot of that. And another little technique that I use, I not only key on the one ball, I also key on the fourth ball, which here would be the eight. And what I'm doing when I approach the cue ball, I'm trying to drive the one ball into the eight with a slightly elevated bridge. And the reason for the elevated bridge, that causes what we call a kill reaction to the cue ball. The cue ball should come back and stop somewhere in the center of the table. If the balls are hit perfectly, the one ball, when breaking from the right side, will always come back to the left. And therefore, you're playing position on the one after the break. I'll demonstrate. That's a good break. That break will get the money for you. Anytime the cue ball is sitting anywhere in the center of the table, you've broke the ball's great. Well, we've seen the nine ball break, but what about the eight ball break? Well, there's a paisan down in South Philadelphia, goes by the name of the Philly Flash. He's gonna explain the eight ball break to us, and his name is Jimmy Fusco. Okay, we're gonna talk a little bit about the break playing eight ball, which is basically very simple. There's two basic breaks playing eight ball. First of all, the object of the break playing eight ball is to make a ball so you can stay at the table, you can continue to shoot. Second of all, playing eight ball, if you make the eight ball on a break, you win. So the first way to break and play an eight ball is you don't have a high percentage to make the eight ball, but you have a better percentage of making a ball and killing the cue ball in the center of the table. So once you do make a ball, you have another shot. So this first way is place the cue ball approximately in the center of the table, hit the one ball, as the top ball, which in this case is the one ball, as full as possible and as hard as possible, and bring the cue ball back in the center of the table in the event that you do make a ball, you have a shot. Let's see if what happens. There, as you can see, I have the cue ball fairly in the center of the table, and with the choice of any shot I want just about, and I think I did pocket a ball on a break. Okay, the second way to break the ball is playing eight ball, is to place the cue ball about two to three inches from the side reel, and you're striking the second ball here, which in this case is the two ball. Hit it as full as possible and draw the cue ball out to the side reel and hopefully back to the center of the table somewhere where you might have another shot if you make a ball on the break. The reason for this break is this break gives the eight ball more chance to find a hole to go in. And if you make the eight ball on the break playing eight ball, you win the game. Let's see what happens. As you can see, the eight ball got out of the rack pretty good. It didn't go, but, and I didn't make a ball, but that's basically the second way to break the ball is playing eight ball. Next, we're going to talk about the one pocket break. Now, one pocket's a lot like playing chess. So let's talk to a guy that's been around the game for a long time. Not only was he a great fighter with a 13-0-1 record, but as a one pocket player, his record might be even better. The man from Phoenix, Arizona, Danny D, Mr. Danny DiLiberto. Now, one packet uses just the two 
corner pockets at the foot of the table. Now, if you hit the balls on the left side to start the game, it means you have the uh, right hand pocket throughout the whole game. Now, there are 15 balls. Whoever pockets eight in their particular pocket first wins the game. Now, if you hit the balls on the right side, then you automatically have the left corner pocket. Now, I like to, uh, in choosing which pocket you would take to start the game breaking, there are some factors. First of all, if you play on a table that you know fairly well, uh, as level as the table is, it usually leans to one side or another. So in picking a pocket, you would love to have the side that the table leans to. Uh, but other than that, all things equal. If you're right-handed, you should take the right-hand pocket simply because there are more selections of shots that can, you can reach shooting in that pocket. Now, if you're left-handed, you would hit the balls on this side and pick the left-hand uh, pocket simply because there are shots you can reach left-handed that you wouldn't be able to reach if you were right-handed. So all things equal without the table leaning, you pick the right-hand pocket if you're right-handed, the left-hand pocket if you're left-handed. Now, the idea of the break is to knock balls towards your pocket and snooker the person so that they can't knock any of those balls away. And the way you would do that would be to just uh, barely brush the head ball with a hair, what we call reverse English. In this case, it would be right-hand English. Let's see if I can execute a good one pocket break. Now that is a pretty fair break. You know, in the game of pool today, the women play this game every bit as well as the men do. So for the straight pool break, let's bring out one of the superstars of the ladies' division. From Costa Mesa, California, Robin Bell. Okay, the straight pool safety break is very important. What I'm going to try to do here is the two ball is going to go to the bottom rail, come back into the pack. The 11 ball is going to go to the side rail and come back to the pack. The cue ball is going to be going three rails, bottom rail, side rail, back over to this side rail, and in this vicinity. That's a take. <laughs> You're right, Robin, that was a take. Great shot. But right now, let's talk about some strategy in one of my favorite games, eight ball. And for more on that, let's go to a guy we call Cool Hand from Owensboro, Kentucky, Nick Varner. Okay, there's over 30 million players that play pool in America, and most of those players, the game they play is eight ball. And I'm gonna show you a little bit about eight ball position and strategy today. And what I'm going to start out, when I look at the table, I try to figure out and figure a plan for the whole table. And uh, I notice the eight's on the other end. So it's natural that I maybe save the two balls that are close to the eight ball to finish up with. So sometimes it works better to kind of work backwards when you're figuring out eight ball position and strategy. So I would rather clear the balls on this end of the table. So I've got plenty of shots I can play the one in the side, the three in the side, the six in that pocket, or the five in this pocket first. But the pattern I like the best is I would like to start out and play the six ball in that pocket because I don't have to make the cue ball move very far and I can play the five in this pocket. Because I want to get to this trouble ball because the 15, I can only play this four ball in one pocket. 
I'd like to get to that trouble ball as early as possible because this could be a real problem because what suicide an eight ball would be for me to run all the balls and end up out in here someplace on the four ball because what I've done is removed all the obstacles for my opponent and made it a lot easier for him to run out. So you really need to plan ahead and you, you need to start out and look at the eight and then look to see where your real problems are at when you're trying to run out a rack of eight ball because once you play along and the problem develops, it's a little bit too late then, so you have to plan ahead. So let's try those first three balls and then I'll play the one and the three ball probably in those two side pockets next. On the six ball, I've got a little angle, so I'll just let it go an inch or two, hit the cue ball about the middle, and go an inch or two to the left. Okay. Now when I play that five ball, I just want to try to pocket the five and have that white ball go forward a little bit so it clears that 13 and just bounce off the rail. Try to get it off the rail a little bit. Okay, now I have to look at this three and one and figure out which one to play first. And what I'm going to do is play that four ball and try to come up and miss that 13. And I try to come up here, and it depends on which one of these two balls I get the best angle on, determines which one I'll play first. Okay, and I've got a nice angle on the three. This is the side of the three that I'd like to be on because now I can go down here and I can end up close to straight in on this one ball. And a lot of times when you're playing eight ball, if you're not a run out player, try to think in terms of playing three balls. Like I cut the three in the side, bounce off the rail, I've got the one straight in the side, and then it's just real natural to go to the two ball next. You just try to play position so that you can move smoothly from one ball to the next because a lot of players are under the misconception that professional players never miss. But they miss just like everybody else, but they just don't miss quite as often. And the reason they don't miss as often is because they keep ending up with one easy shot like this after another. The real key to the game is position play. So let's see if we can get these last balls off the table. Okay. Nice thing about playing by yourself is you can do that. <laughs> okay, now I just want to bounce off the rail so I got a shot on the two next. And just bounce off the rail when I play the two so I got a good shot on that seven. And I end up with a shot that I think anybody would like to have if you happen to be playing for 50 cents or a dollar a game. I think anybody in this room would like to shoot at this eight ball as a last shot. So that shows you a little bit about the thinking processes when you're playing eight ball position. You know, I've often said that this next gentleman is the luckiest pool player I've ever seen. But you know something? It isn't luck. It's just good defense. So for more on the battle of defense, let's talk to the king himself from Scranton, Pennsylvania, Jimmy Rempe. You know, a lot of people think pool is a strictly an offensive game. Well, it's not. There's a lot of defense in the game. And it could cause you to win a lot of matches that you would have lost if you shot the wrong percentage shot. In this situation, Playing nine ball, you're on the two ball, so you have to hit the two first. There's no shot down table or up table because the pockets are blocked. So what I want to do is go to the bottom cushion here with right hand English, send the two over the, this cushion here, then back to the middle of the table here. In the meantime, the cue ball is going to come up table, and maybe I'll get lucky and put you behind one of these other balls. If not, you're still not going to have a shot anyway. Call it a nice shot, not a very friendly one, but a nice one.
you do that consistently, you're going to get the money. Okay, here's the same situation where the cue ball is still in the same place and two balls still in the same place. Only this time I moved all the balls on this side of the table. The way to play safe off this shot is to try to put the cue ball behind the wall of balls and leave the two ball over in this area of the table. It's a good shot and it's going to give your opponent a lot of trouble. What you want to do is you just thin the two ball with a lot of left hand English with the right speed and something like that. That's going to win for you a lot of times. You know, there's only one husband and wife team in the history of the game of pool to have both won world championships. So let's bring her out now and talk a little bit more about defense. And speaking of defense, she knows it, believe me. She's my wife, Ava Mataya. As you can see here, I do not have a shot on the one ball. So here's where we go into the defensive part of the game. What I will try to do is knock the one ball down table and hide the cue ball behind the orange ball to where my opponent does not have a shot. Like that. And as you can see, she cannot even hit the ball. And if she does not hit the ball, I will have cue ball in hand anywhere on the table, and that makes the game a lot easier. You know, when it comes to shooting combos, that's short for combination shots, there's a lot of different theories on how to execute them. So let's bring out one of the masters of the combination shot. From St. Louis, Missouri, the Iceman, Larry Hubbard. Combination shots are some of the more difficult shots in the game of pool. Any professional will tell you, never take a combination shot for granted. A method that I've used over the years to make combination shots is to first, we're gonna play the nine ball on the side. First, we have to decide where we wanna hit the nine ball. Draw a line from the pocket through the nine ball to the point of contact. Next, we have to line up the first ball with that point of contact on the nine, draw a line through that to the rail. This gives us a target. The target is actually the rail. When getting down to shoot, you're actually aiming the two ball through the nine at a target on the rail. Playing the nine ball inside. Now here's a young lady that's got her own idea of how to shoot combination shots. And who is she? Well, she comes from Hillsboro, New Jersey. And she's the great Lori John Jones. This shot is called a combination shot. What I'm going to do is make the eight ball hit the nine ball, and the nine ball is going to go into the corner pocket. Now you have to remember that a combination, no matter how easy it looks, it's not easy. What you want to do is perceive the combination. You want to kind of, you don't ever want to aim the eight ball into the nine ball and try to hit that little spot because it's almost impossible. So just perceive it and aim it up. And then when your brain says hit it, trust your brain and it'll usually go. And stroke through on the ball. It's also very important. And that's the way you do a combination. You know, shooting combos is cool. And speaking of cool, this next young superstar, he's going to give us his theory on how to shoot combination shots. We call him California Cool from Modesto, Kim Davenport. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about combination shots. Now, this particular shot, everything is straight in. So when I shoot this shot, I don't even look at the one ball. I just shoot straight through the nine, and the ball should go. So remember, when you're shooting a combination and they're straight in, just go right through the, the object ball and right to the ball that you're going to pocket. Well, next we want to talk about kiss shots. And this young lady ought to know. You see, she kissed me six years ago in Yavla, Sweden. And we've been together ever since. Once again, my wife, Ava. What I'm going to try to show you right now is something called a kiss shot. This shot, shot comes up more often than you might think. In this case, the two ball, the blue ball, does not have a pocket to go in. So what you try to do is use another object ball on the table to help it out. 
What I'm going to try to do is make the two ball come down this rail and be pocketed in this side pocket by kissing off the six ball. And that's what's called a kiss shot. Now let me show you a few more variations of what I call the kiss shot. That's a good one. Here's a tricky way to pocket two balls in one shot, playing both the eight ball and the nine ball in the side pocket. Actually, it's not really that big a mystery when you know the inside secret. How many times has this happened to you when you were playing eight ball? You have the solids, your opponent has the stripes, you make all your solids, good shots and everything, and what happens, the cue ball comes down, rolls around right behind his last ball. You got the eight ball hanging right in the corner, but you can't see it. This is when we use what is called the masse shot. And to execute the masse shot, you have to elevate the butt of your cue. Now, what I want this cue ball to do is to go around the 11 and curve back in to pocket the eight. So as I'm looking at my cue ball, imagine that it's a clock. To make this shot here, I'm going to hit it at 2 o'clock. That's high right-hand English. Ball's going to swerve out to the left. The English is going to take it to the right, making the 8 ball, the Massey shot. No problem, but it needs a little bit of practice. And don't get frustrated on Massey shots, because they're very difficult. Just practice them a little bit. They're a lot of fun anyway. Now here's another version of the Mass A shot, only this one is a difficult one and requires a lot of practice. I'm going to try to pocket the five ball into the corner, have my cue ball come up table, come back down, and make the nine. Now as I'm shooting this, I want you to imagine the clock that I'm looking at, my cue ball. As I'm coming down on this ball, I'm hitting it at 10 o'clock. Remember that, 10 o'clock, coming straight down on it, the cue has to be elevated straight up and down. Just like that. Here's another version of the extreme mass A shot. Now what I want to do is have my cue ball swing out to the center of the table, around the yellow ball, and come back and pocket the orange ball. Now once again, I'm looking at a clock. My cue ball is a clock. I'm going to hit this ball with my cue straight up and down like this. As I'm looking down at the cue ball, I'm going to hit my cue ball at right about at 4.30. Right between 4 and 5 o'clock. Play the orange ball. Now remember, when you're shooting this mass A shot, as you're looking down on the cue ball, I'm hitting it right between 4 and 5 o'clock. So let's call it 4.30. <laughs> The jump shot is a shot you need to incorporate in case you're ever snookered and need to hit your object ball. Now, there is a legal jump shot and it is executed by elevating the back of your cue and striking down on the cue ball. This forces the cue ball into the bed and actually up off the bed. And in this particular shot, you will see it will jump over the three and the four ball to strike the eight and pocket the eight in the side. Now, there are uh, people that may try and scoop the ball. Now, that is not a legal shot. In order to execute a jump shot, which I'll show you, you must strike down on the cue ball. That's a legal jump shot. That was terrific, Belinda. And speaking of jump shots, here's a guy that jumps all over the country making cash. 
I call him the Denver Dynamite, Danny Medina. Okay, say we're playing last pocket eight ball, or we're playing one pocket. One pocket, you got to make both balls in this pocket, and if you make the eight in this pocket, I mean, your last ball, you got to make the eight here too. So now I'm going to bank this ball in and jump the cue ball over the eight to get position for the eight in this corner. There it is. You know, down Philadelphia way, they tell me that Fusco would just as soon bank a ball as shoot it straight in. Let's find out how he makes all those bank shots. We're going to talk a little bit now about the bank shot. In banks, basically, there's two ingredients. Number one is cue ball English, and number two is speed. Now, this particular shot, we're going to put the one ball on the spot and line the cue ball up almost half the dif distance to the side, this side pocket here. Now, a bank is when the cue ball contacts the object ball, drives the object ball to one or more cushions, and then into a pocket. Now, in this particular bank, we're going to try and make this bank with medium speed and no English because the angle is the same way coming off the rail as it is going to the rail. So we should be able to pocket this ball cross side. Now, if I was to take that same exact shot, put the, cube, the object ball around the spot where it was before, and the cue ball in the same exact spot, and put right hand English on the cue ball, and hit the same spot that I hit before when I made the ball, the right hand English should make the one ball come long here, should make the one ball spin to the left. Now, this one ball should hit approximately right here. Same speed, but just a little bit of right hand English. You see what I mean? It hit right there with the right hand English. Now if I take the same shot and put left hand English on the cue ball, still contacting the, contacting the reel at the same spot, I should shorten this ball up and the one ball should hit approximately right here. Now the second ingredient in banking is speed. If you hit, a ball, hit the, the cue ball hard, it'll shorten the, the object ball up. If you hit the cue ball easy, it'll make the object ball lengthen. So now if I hit the same exact spot again, same exact shot, with no English, same spot, easy, should lengthen this ball to here. You see how it lengthened, almost the same principle as putting right hand English on it. Now the same shot again, if I hit real hard to the same spot, it's, it should shorten the shot up to here again, the same as the inside English did. Hit it real hard, it'll shorten it up. Just like that. Now you see that speed and English are the basic two ingredients in the bank shot. You know, even the spectacular Robin Bell practices her bank shots, using cue ball in hand to get the proper angles, and then she's going to tell you how to finish off the routine. On this particular practice routine, it would be the bank shots. Again, you would pick up the cue ball after you're done. With the Thank you. With a more advanced player, again, you try not to move the cue ball. And you would go just go all the way around. You practice that one. You know, when you knock people out in the ring, you got to play position on them. Well, it's the same thing with knocking a ball in the hole. If you want to make just more than one at a time, you've got to play position. So let's listen to Danny D. Now, extreme English just causes you to miss balls and at great distances. Using the extreme English, you it would be almost impossible to hit your object ball where you're aiming. Now, uh, I believe that you can go from low to center to high and it doesn't change your line of aim. But if you go left to right, you're not going to hit that object ball uh, where you think you're going to hit it. 
So uh, back to the position shot. If you leave the proper angle, then high, low, or center will get you to the next ball. I'll demonstrate a couple of those. In this case, I know that the angle I have on the eight, if I hit the cue ball above center, the cue ball will float down this way for the nine ball. So once you decide that this particular shot calls for hitting the cue ball above center, your total concentration is at your target on the object ball. You don't steer the cue ball, it will automatically go to the next ball. That's it. Of course then, uh, Practicing the proper speeds is all you have to do to get to the next ball. Uh, this is another position shot that comes up pretty uh, regularly. Now on this shot, what you want to do is hit the cue ball a little bit below center. No English. Aim at your target, follow through, and the cue ball should go one, two, three rails to the nine. Now, once I've decided to hit it below center, not left or right, just below center, I just concentrate at my target and the cue ball will do the rest. All you do is hit the cue ball above center with a hair right hand English and a level stroke. If you execute that, you don't have to pound the cue ball to get it around. Nice level stroke, hair above center, and a follow through. That's all you have to do to get to the ball. Now, uh, about English. When I shoot that eight ball in the pocket and the cue ball hits this rail, the friction of the cue ball hitting the rail automatically puts right hand English on the ball. So that's why I say you only need a little bit. I'll shoot it one more time and you'll note that the cue ball will automatically get some English on it. And if you execute the level stroke, you never have to shoot hard. Shooting hard makes the pockets a little bit smaller. You can slap a ball in shooting easy, but if you shoot hard and hit the rail, it's just not going to go in. Now I'd like to talk a little bit more about the cue ball. Whatever you do to the cue ball, the very first ball you hit has the exact opposite in it. It's like the gear principle. So that if you're froze on a ball like this, and it's aiming to the right of the pocket, you want the nine ball to go to the left. So if you put right hand English on the cue ball, it will spin like gears and throw the nine to the left before it lets go. It's like gears. Now this will hold through with two balls. See, right hand English threw that nine ball in to the left. Now, if you were froze on two balls, now you're froze on two balls. Right hand English does not throw this nine ball to the left because it is the gear principle. When you put right hand English on this ball, the eight would have left hand English and twirl the nine to the right. So if I wanted this ball to throw to the left now, this would have to go left, the eight ball would have to have right hand English, and the cue ball would have to have left hand English. Try that. That's the shot. It works like gears. Okay, in this particular shot, I'm going to try to make the five ball 
drive through the nine ball into this pocket. Now the way I do that is by hitting the cue ball low. It spins this way and causes the five to spin that way. See if I can drive it through there. That's the gear principle. This next shot involves what the professional call throwing the ball. We have two balls frozen together. The 12 ball in the front is actually aimed at the point, not at the pocket. Throwing the ball involves changing the path of the 12 ball so that it will go in the side pocket. The way you do this is to bring the cue ball on this side of the combination shot. One of the most common mistakes that amateurs make is they treat a throw shot much like they do a cut shot. Because it's aimed here on that side of the side pocket, they feel like they need to try to cut the 12 ball in. Well, that's not going to work. You really have to do the reverse. In order to make a ball throw, when they're frozen, you have to hit it on the opposite side. I'm going to hit the 13. It's going to change the path of the 12, and it'll make it go in the side pocket. Learn those throw shots and you won't be throwing away any dough, that's for sure. But let's talk about some draw. And here's a real quick draw. I call him Elvis, but everybody else calls him St. Louis Louie. I play nine ball. And in nine ball, during the course of playing the game professionally, there's a certain stroke that is very important. It's called the draw stroke. At this time, what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about the power draw. The power draw is simple, self-explanatory. You're going to put maximum English on the cue ball. It's just like a golfer or a tennis player, when he follows all the way through or when they tee off. What we're going to do with the power draw is we're going to remember, have confidence with your tip, plenty of chalk always, and the snap of the wrist. You're going to really let go. In this little instance here, we've got the eight ball straight in the corner with no angle. We need shape on the nine ball. Okay, what I'm gonna do is show you the power draw. It's gonna be a full snap of the wrist, low right hand spin to get position on that nine ball. Now, what I'd like to explain about the power draw is the simple fact that most draw shots or it's not always so imperative that we aim so low on the cue ball. But when you're shooting the power draw, you must practice constantly to build confidence in aiming as low as possible on this round object. And lots of chalk because of the friction. We're going to try and turn this ball to its maximum amount. Okay, this is simple. Just set up balls constantly like this. Just keep practicing over and over. Watch the wrist. Snap that wrist. Aim very low. And snap the wrist. There is going to be many, many times in your challenge at this game where learning and being able to execute the draw is going to be one of your biggest assets on improvement. So many times you're going to be faced with this kind of situation. Look here. The cue ball and the five are not really at a very good angle. And the ball is down here. I've got some angle. Let's say I've got hardly no angle. Here's the power draw one more time. Maximum, low right, full confidence, keep the head down, and make sure that you snap the wrist. So
So remember, practice the power draw. It's going to become a very big asset in your arsenal to play this game well. Snap the wrist. Make sure you aim low. Have confidence in your tip. Now let's listen to one of the power strokers of the game, Danny Medina, and how he draws his ball. I'm going to show a few draw shots here. Like here, I got the 1-3 here. I just broke the balls. The 1-3 is laying there. But the 5 and 9 is dead over here. So what I could do is I could just hit the 1 and draw the cue ball back to make the 9. It's better than running the table. Isn't it? Okay, here again, I'm going to draw this ball cue ball right back to make the nine ball instead of running the table, which is really easy to do. Okay, say you're playing nine ball and you just broke the balls and they ended up like this. The four and five are tied up over there and you, you just can't break them out, but the nine is laying in front of the hole here. You can draw your cue ball right off of this two ball and make the nine instead of trying to go for the break. I'm going to try to do it. Now, Abe is going to explain to us a few basic fundamentals on how to follow a ball. Speaking of following, I'd follow this chick anywhere. What I'd like to show you right now is what's called follow a ball. You, hit, you do that by hitting high on the cue ball and stay, keeping your head down and stroking nice and smooth. Now, just remember, just stay down, follow through, nice and smooth. Speaking of following balls, well, here's a guy that's been following balls all his life. He's none other than Diamond Jim from West Palm Beach, Florida, Jimmy Reed. Right now, I'm going to explain how to follow the cue ball correctly. By follow, it's just above center. And the, the further you go above center on the, on the cue ball with a cue tip, the more top spin it takes. Now I'm going to put maximum follow, which is just the opposite from maximum draw, which is the bottom of the cue ball. And by following the ball, instead of hitting down on the top of the ball, you lower your right hand and shoot up on the cue ball from the rear. In other words, the front of my stick is higher than my right hand behind. To follow the ball, maximum top spin. You know, if you want to be a champion in this game, you've got to have a great mental attitude. And this next young man has all of that. He is a true world champion. From Towson, Maryland, we call him Captain Hook, Mike Siegel. All right, let's talk a little bit about mental attitude. Now, nine ball is a very strange game. I've been playing nine ball in tournaments for many, many years. A lot of times your opponent may miss a shot, he may leave you safe. You may miss an easy shot, let's say on the nine ball lose the game. The best tip I can give you in nine ball, because this game is a very strange game, it's very tough because you always have to shoot the lowest numbered ball on the table. Let's say I put the cue ball in this area. Playing any other game, I could shoot, let's say, 14 and one. I could shoot the five, the seven, the four. But in nine ball, many times situations like this come up. Shooting at the one ball, no shot. The best thing you can do, my tip would be, Try and take advantage of every opportunity you get. In this particular type of game, some days you're going to get shots, some days you aren't. The only thing you can do is try and do your best when you get an opportunity. I found that that has improved my game a big percentage, and I've been winning a lot of tournaments lately, and I think that is probably one of the reasons why. Well, friends, you've been watching the greatest masters in the world, both men and women, doing their thing on the green felt. Well, now it's time for you to take your cue, practice, be patient, and above all, be self-motivated. That's very, very important. 
And who knows, just one day you might find yourself sitting in the finals of the championship of the world. I, for one, want to wish you all the best luck in the world. Because old Floyd is going to be there waiting for you.